This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Yun at the Sunny United Methodist Church, March 3rd, 2024. The message is, the third day, Thomas, based on John 20, 24 to 31. Today's gospel comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Would you join me as I pray? Loving, gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this wonderful opportunity to come together and worship and glorify your name. We are grateful for the reason why we are here in your presence. Even if things are not going well in our lives, we still have reason to worship and rejoice in you. Oh God, I am not eloquent. I'm not articulate. I'm slow of tongue. But Lord, use my words to speak to your people to share the message of hope, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with your people. Come Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds to your life-giving, life-transforming words. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So a person working for a global internet search engine company discovers something unusual, something interesting. 200 times a second around the clock, someone on the globe is typing up into a computer search engine basically this question, is God real? Is God real? 200 times a second. It's a lot of people. You know, one day is 86,000 seconds, as we all know. So it's 70,280,000 people a day. Why? Why are so many people wondering if God is real? The question is, can the internet provide an answer to this significant life-changing question? Can ChatGPT or other AI-based search engines tell you the answer they're looking for? Today's Gospel story teaches us where we can find answers to this question. How we approach doubts and disbeliefs as Christians. You know why? Because the question, is God real? It's not just an intellectual question. Many times, it's a relational question. I believe this search engine result signifies people's deep spiritual yearning, a longing for God, whether they identify themselves as a Christian or not. 
The meaning of this question can vary depending on the circumstances people are in or the perspective of the person asking this question. For some people, grappling with this question may arise from doubts or conflicts with their own religious beliefs they have embraced for years but don't seem to align with their current experiences or observation of the world. There was a man in my home church in South Korea who wrestled with the same question years ago. He was a very faithful, devout Christian, a respected Sunday school teacher. You know, when he opens his mouth for prayers, anyone in the sanctuary feels inspired, not only by his simple but profound spiritual language, but also by his assurance for God's love. You know, his... his uh, trust in God expressed through the, his tone of voice and his overall attitude as a Christian. However, after experiencing a personal tragedy, he lost his faith and eventually ended up becoming an atheist. Rumors circulated about you know, this man and without confirmation, we were left to wonder as he ceased attending the church. The congregation, myself included, was quite shocked and taken aback by this news. How could one transition from unwavering faith to a complete rejection of God? Sometimes people type up this question during the times of personal tragedy. And they may be seeking guidance, assurance, clarity about their faith, Refusing to what doesn't make sense to them. Thomas, one of the disciples, wrestles with a similar question in today's gospel reading. But three days after his crucifixion and death, there were some women and the disciples who claimed they, that they have seen the Lord. Along with his fellow disciples, he had been grieving the tragic loss of their beloved teacher and friend, Jesus Christ. Now the other disciples are filled with joy and wonder. He wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. He, he missed the scene for whatever reason. He's not even sure if the scene was real. You know, maybe he, they saw an illusion collectively because of their trauma and loss. Now he has a few options. One of the options is to just go with the flow. Pretending to believe in the resurrection of Jesus like the other disciples. Second, the second option is to be honest. To be honest with where he is and refusing to believe. One thing we need to note here is that technically speaking, Thomas wasn't doubting. He wasn't doubting. You know, doubt is different from unbelief or disbelief. If you doubt something, it means you already accepted something as part of your belief. Doubt is therefore not the absence of faith, but the questioning of faith. You can only doubt what you already believe. In other words, doubt presupposes some kind of faith, some kind of belief. It's one of the most common struggles in the Christian life. In the case of Thomas, though, he was disbelieving. He was refusing to believe, but his disbelief had a purpose. Is the resurrection of Jesus real? He wanted to know the truth. He wanted to experience the truth. Thomas didn't absolutize his disbelief either. You know, he opened himself to the deeper truth when given reason to do so. He could have just left the circle of the disciples feeling isolated. We know how he feels when you are the only one who missed seeing and experiencing something amazing, something remarkable. He could have felt, oh, 
I guess I don't belong here anymore. Despite his disbelief and misalignment with the other disciples' experiences, Thomas stayed in the community of disciples, and that's where he encountered the resurrected Jesus. My Lord, my God, my Lord and my God. You know, it isn't just the exclamation like, oh my God, like we do, like we say. It's a heartfelt faith statement from Thomas. Thomas witnesses that resurrection of Jesus is real. And the reason Jesus is his Lord and the God of the universe Eight days before this moment, his stance was clear to his fellow disciples who asserted they had seen the Lord. Thomas says, until I see his hands, fill the wounds of the nails and put my hand to his side, I will not believe what you are saying. So what happened to this doubting, disbelieving Thomas on that day? How could his doubt and skepticism turn into such a deeper faith? As Tom Burley notes in his book, Third Day, doubt can take us deeper in faith and life, letting us explore experience things we would have missed otherwise. Therefore, doubt, disbelief can be a form of gift from God because it will help us explore, experience things we would have missed otherwise. Just pretending. This is a good news shared by the story of Thomas. Like Thomas, we haven't seen the physical presence of the resurrection. We haven't touched the side of Jesus. We haven't touched the wounds of Jesus. We may have some doubts and disbeliefs like Thomas at some point of our life journey. But the key to this journey is to stay connected to a community of faith who would believe for you, trust for you, and pray for you, even when you cannot believe and pray and trust. Here's a story. There was a man named Hans and Hans and his wife were very much in love. Nearly every day they took long walks together holding hands and they always sat close in church and worship until his wife died suddenly. Overwhelming Hans with sorrow his life was almost dead. <clears throat> Worried because he wouldn't eat nor take walks, three of his friends visited him regularly and he remained still very lonely and depressed. Experiencing dark night of the soul, Hans told his friends, well, I'm no longer able to pray to God. In fact, I'm not certain I believe in God anymore. After a moment of silence, one of his friends said, Hans, then, when, then we will believe for you. We will pray for you. So this man met daily for prayers, asking God to restore the gift of faith to their dear friend Hans. Many months later, as the four gathered with Hans, Hans smiled and said, it's no longer necessary for you to pray for me and believe for me. Today I would like to pray and believe with me. I would like you to pray and believe with me. In his book, Max Ruccato talks about the importance of the community of faith in times of questions and doubts and disbeliefs. He writes, quotes, questions can make hermits out of us. 
driving us into hiding. Yet the cave has no answers. Christ distributes courage through community. He dissipates doubt through fellowship. He never deposits all knowledge in one person, but distributes doubts, I mean pieces of the jigsaw puzzle to many. When you interlock your understanding with mine, and we share our discoveries, when we mix, mingle, confess, and pray, Christ speaks." Unquote. Friends, I believe this is what it means to be a community of faith. I believe this is what it means to be a community of Christian believers. This shows what it means to have Christian faith. It's, a, it's about building a community of faith where people embrace doubts, disbeliefs, as an opportunity to deepen their trust in the Lord. It's about building a community of faith where people know where to take their doubts and disbeliefs, skepticism, takes them to the community. It's about building a community where people believe for you when you can believe. Pray for you when you don't know what to pray for. Trust for you when you can no longer trust. It's about building a community where people experience safe holding environment for you to be who you are and who God called you to be. During this season of land, we are exploring five biblical figures as we engage in the sermon series the third day. Remember, we're practicing a spiritual exercise of celebrating, embracing Sunday as a little Easter. I wonder how your exercise is going. This exercise of celebrating Easter as a little, I mean, each Sunday as a little Easter. Where do you experience the power of the res resurrection during this season of Lent? Last year, as you know, we visited South Korea, my family, went together to South Korea. We attended the church where my wife and I grew up together. And I heard the good news there. You know, the guy I mentioned in the beginning of my sermon who lost faith, he came back to church. His faith was restored. And I know there was his family, this congregation who have supported him, believed for him, trusted for him, Pray for him in the midst of the doubts and disbeliefs. Isn't this the power of resurrection, friends? Isn't this what we are called to be as a community of faith? I don't know about you, but if you find yourself in the place of Thomas this morning, what would be your next step? What would God call you to be and to do? If you see someone in your life grappling with the faith questions like Thomas, is God real? Is the resurrection of Jesus real? How can you share the gospel of resurrection with them? Are you willing to embrace and believe for them? Amen.